You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Welcome to Gabriola TV. I'm Teresa O'Leary and I'm here with Susan Yates, who is a trustee with Islands Trust. And we are going to have a conversation about what's been going on in terms of the extreme fire risk that's been going on in Kelowna, in Canada, and really around the world. But we're going to look at it from the point of view of Gabriola. So the last couple of weeks have been pretty brutal for all of us as we've been watching the news going on in Maui, evacuations in uh, Yellowknife, mm -hmm. and then of course the devastation that's been happening in Kelowna, so close to home. What's been going through your mind as you've been watching? What's been going through my mind is most of what is happening right now with the climate disaster could have been prevented by the very humans that have caused this extreme rapid change in the climate. And it breaks my heart that people have to suffer so much with the extremes of climate change. And in particularly, particular, I was thinking of residents of Yellowknife and, and maybe the First Nations people who have lived in that area for thousands of years with no discernible impact on the climate. And yet they are the ones who are suffering so, so much from, you know, colonialism, from the capitalist lifestyle that we have so heartily embraced. They suffer the impacts of, of this terrible climate disaster that other people have caused through selfishness, greed, some ignorance, although that would be very hard to claim ignorance at this point. And that breaks my heart, really. So Susan, with everything that's been happening these last few weeks, mm -hmm. a lot of people are very, very concerned about the future. Mm -hmm. As an authority with Islands Trust, mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with that? What do you say to you, the people who are coming to you and asking you for guidance? And they, they are coming to me, not necessarily for guidance. They are coming to me with extreme worry, concern. What are you doing about it? Um, they're mostly coming to me with, not, not for guidance, but concern. And what I tell them is, I did run on a mandate, very clearly stated, that I was going to support the object and the mandate of the Islands Trust, and that is to preserve and to protect the 13 main islands and the 450 satellite islands in the Trust area. And I will not waver on that. But what it usually means is I'm, there's a lofty mandate that the Islands Trust has to preserve and protect. But there are, there are so few tools in order to realize that mandate. So almost every time I have to say to someone, oh, I'm really sorry, but we actually have no tree cutting authority. Yes, someone can clear cut their entire lot and devastate that little microbiome. And yes, someone can pave, you know, 30% of their lot and not think about, well, could you just put down a surface that lets the water come through, that lets some green things grow. We have no control over any of that. We don't have subdivision authority. And I can tell you, a lot of what happens in the final development phases of subdivisions rests with MOTI, the Transport Ministry of Transportation, and not with the Islands Trust. We don't have control over groundwater resources. Uh, really, no one has control over groundwater resources except the people who extract. And, you know, for domestic use, most of us are pretty reasonable and we think about our neighbors as to how we try to catch water and save it when we get the winter rains. Um, but there are people who are not considerate of their neighbors. I can tell you, I'll give you an example of a concern that came up just a few days ago and this person was almost in tears telling me that their neighbor was watering their lawn and washing their vehicle weekly. Well, I just feel sick about that. How can someone be so ignorant and so careless and so selfish as to think it's okay to water a lawn and wash a vehicle when your neighbor's well is running low? 
So given the island trust governing bodies makeup, mm -hmm. it sounds like you are restricted in, in what you can do. Mm -hmm. So that's the question then, what can islands trust do? as we move forward. Right. Well, what we can do is we are in charge of land use um, zoning, zoning bylaws. Most of the zoning and land use is already in place. So ideally, what you'd want to do in a climate emergency is down zone. Nobody wants to see a down zoning and a devaluing of their or devaluing money wise of their property. So the other thing you can do is Occasionally, there can be crown land pieces coming up, you know, that you could put in under some sort of protection. But my first thought is, what about First Nations? They should have first say over what land becomes available. They, this was their land, you know, and let's face it, if they were still living here without the effects of colonialism and capitalism, it's highly unlikely we'd, we'd be faced with this climate emergency. So there's really not very much you can do to preserve water, to preserve trees. Um, one thing I'd like to see, which is going to be taking time because if it was up to me, I'd do it right now, is have this entire island um, in a development permit area, which would mean that every action landowners take, and it doesn't prevent you from building a house or doing whatever you need to do, but it means that every action landowners take would be subject to the conditions of a development permit that would protect the coastal Douglas first forest as much as possible, protect uh, water catchment areas. And we have, we are so lacking in development permit areas on Gabriola. We is, have like maybe three little wee ones. Is that because it doesn't really have a town council? No, it's is, because over the years, um, it's ne it was never seen as a priority. And um, so 30 years ago, I was a trustee. 35 years ago, I was a trustee. I don't even think we had development permit areas then. I'm sure I would have done something if we did, because that would have been something that I would do. Um, we also have a development application information bylaw that is sorely out of date. That's been on our work program for, well, since I was elected, because I put it on there. And, you know, that would help a lot too, because that would mean that any area that is under development permit area would have pretty stringent guidelines as to how to do this and do this and do this. It doesn't stop development. It guides it in a far more climate sensitive way. But we're lacking those tools right now on Gabriola. And how do you get those tools? We have to, um, well, right now the big project on, online is our official community plan update. And that's been in the works for some years. We need to do that. Those tools can be part of an OCP update. If it were totally up to me, I would put those tools first before I even did an OCP review. However, our OCP review can cover those. I just hope that it does in the end. And we do need an OCP review. It's like 25 years out of date. Okay. It's not, you know, it doesn't, it has hardly anything about climate change. It has almost nothing about First Nations and it's lacking uh, some good wording on housing. And, you know, housing, yeah, that's a whole other issue of environmental concern. Absolutely. Because if everybody lived in places like me, Frank, probably Ben, probably you, we wouldn't be also in such a state of climate emergency. And I wish that we could have stronger guidelines, um, like lot coverage, for example. You don't cover half your lot with your house, you know. There's... A 3,000 square foot maximum. I'd be happy with a thousand square feet myself, which I don't even have. But let's say 3,000 square feet. There's no maximum, you know, um, square footage for building homes on Gabriola. That's nuts. So. Now I'm new to the island, yeah. and I'm a little confused. So maybe for the sake of me and other new people to the uh, coming to the island or visitors. Yeah. Can you tell me what's the relationship between Islands Trust mm -hmm. 
and the regional district of Nanaimo in yeah. terms of managing the right. islands and the growth mm -hmm. and the development and all of that. that. That is confusing. So generally, Islands Trust is in charge of land use um, and zoning. The regional district is in charge of services. So, so that includes things like if we wanted a water district or if we wanted a housing authority, takes care of our garbage. Um, in some areas, it would take care of, well, it takes care of recycle too with the blue box thing. But we have our own recycling depot, which I think does a far better job. That's another topic. <laughs> um, so it is confusing because regional district is services and Islands Trust is land use. We have to work together right. on a number of things, like for example, building permits. Whenever someone takes out a building permit at the regional district office, it must comply with the land use, um, the zoning for wherever they're building. And ideally, anyone new to the island who is building would come into this office and pick up one of many handouts we have here, telling people a lot of good information about water, about sewage disposal, about trees on the island, about particular ecology of Gabriola. Um, you know, but, and ideally, this is my real dream, is that all of the realtors on the island would send people here right away. Go to the Islands Trust office, pick up the necessary information before you even think about what you're going to build on your lot. Okay, bringing us back to where we are right now in this really extreme fire risk. Mm -hmm. A lot of Gabrielans are feeling very vulnerable right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that in 2019, Islands Trust did declare a climate change emergency. They did. So can you tell us what's been done since 2019 as a result of that declaration? Mm -hmm. Uh, what steps have been taken to deal with all of the various issues around that and what's the plan going forward? Well, I was actually at that council meeting in March of 2019 where the Islands Trust made two really important declarations, one on reconciliation and one on climate, the climate emergency. And I actually remember the presentation that a former trustee from Salt Spring, Peter Lamb, did um, that kind of instigated the um, climate emergency declaration on, at that council meeting. So since that time, um, in a way, it was a very important declaration because it is considered at every step of, well, what shall we say, deliberations that council makes and also local trust committees make. So for example, when we're redoing the Islands Trust policy statement, which is kind of in a stalled period right now for various reasons, um, that climate emergency declaration will be right up front and center. When we work on our official community plan on Gabriola, that climate emergency declaration will be right up front and center. Um, let's see what else. Uh, anything the, that the Islands Trust Conservancy works on and I am a board member on the Conservancy which I feel so fortunate to have been elected to that board as well. Always that climate emergency declaration will be considered. Although I have to say um, with things like the Islands Trust Conservancy even without that declaration we would be always looking at climate change. Of course. Which are the properties that we may be able to save? You know, Which are the areas in the trust area that are the most important ecological niches or that provide maybe a flyway for migrating birds or a little migration place for salamanders, things like that. Mm -hmm. The Conservancy would certainly be looking at the climate emergency with or without a declaration. But it is nice to have that solid declaration in place to say we recognize this as, you know, as feeble as our tools may be the philosophy that we carry with us is strong. Okay, so, you know, I'm very well versed in how to handle an earthquake. Yes. Because there were a lot of public education campaigns mm -hmm. going on over the years to ensure mm -hmm. that the public knew what to do, mm -hmm. right? We all have our kits. Where is the equivalent in this time right. with the fire or risk? the fire risk. Why aren't authorities stepping up mm. and upping the game? Well, you know, I, I think our local fire department 
actually does provide quite good information. So I think they sort of, you know, and, um, and our local and provincial emergency service um, that works out of, I can't remember, it works out of the People for a Healthy Community or separate. Anyway, okay. they certainly provide guidelines similar to earthquake emergency. Have this stuff ready in case of fire, you know. But as far as evacuation, actually, I that would be a really good thing to interview the fire chief about because I, some months ago, maybe a year ago, they did a really good evacuation exercise from the whalebone area using the Gertie bus um, to get, because there's only one way in and one way out of whalebone unless you're going to leave by, by a boat. So the Islands Trust, as far as what we can offer, well, I would love to say to people, stop cutting all the trees. <laughs> that is the best insurance against climate change is leaving forests, even leaving copses of trees. And why so, can't you as an authority make that happen in cities? I know. There are all kinds know, of rules about what you I do know. on your land with your trees. Yeah. So we, why is it here asked. you don't have the, the Well, okay, authority. I'm going to be really blunt here. Okay. We were ready to ask, ready to ask, ready to ask, as a council, go to the province and say to the Ministry of Forests, give us this power to limit tree cutting, uh, especially in the, you know, with considering our mandate, right? Exactly. And especially considering that when you move here, you should be aware that you're moving to a somewhat protected area. Well, we were just about ready to go to the province with that request, and then there was like, um, what would you call this? A, a contra, a, a contra movement of sorts, that came from council members on other islands, to not ask for that. I see. To not ask for that, and then it was almost like kind of like a little mini bad wildfire going around council. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they're right, oh yeah, he's right, oh yeah, oh yeah, we can't ask for that. It's like, oh, are you kidding? <laughs> you know, we worked so hard for this, you know. So some of us were just in despair. It got, it got voted, like, they voted not to do it. That yeah, must have been disappointing for you. I was shocked. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there is a lot more that we need to ask the province for to support the Islands Trust. Our budget is dismal from the province, considering that we have a provincial mandate to do this work, mm -hmm. and we get less than 2% of our budget from the province. The rest has to be raised through taxpayers, you know, many of which don't really care about the mandate of the Islands Trust. But so these islands are supposed to be protected and preserved for the whole province to enjoy. So tell me more about the origins of the Island Trust I know it was, you know, 19, it's 50 years ago next June, yes, right? Yes, yes. So, you know, I think a lot of people at this stage have forgotten why these islands are protected. I've even forgotten. So I've almost forgotten us. and I've lived yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> so like remind us, what is so special <laughs> yeah. about these islands that we have to protect them? Well, they're an archipelago in the Salish Sea between three large urban areas, Victoria, Vancouver, and Nanaimo. They're a really popular place to come and visit, and I still have no problem with that. Please come and visit. Please be so careful about how you come and visit. Um, but those of us who live here, I, I mean, I take this really seriously. Those of us who live here really need to be good stewards. You know, just not just because we live here, but because we're supposed to be caring for these islands for everybody in the province. And I sometimes think, uh, I, I wish when the Islands Trust had been formed that there had been more thought and care and time put into doing it. I know it was, it was because of a, an immediate reaction to rampant development on Pender and Gabriola actually, Two developments, Magic Lakes and something called Wildwood, not Wildwood, Wildwood, on Gabriola caused the province to say, oh, we got to put a 10-acre freeze on these islands and then figure out what to do with them. Right. So after the 10-acre freeze, they said, okay, we'll you know, put, put the control of land use zoning and bylaws into this special, this special agency, mm -hmm. which was good. Um, 
but the agency never got the tools it needed to complete the job and to do the job well. So, I mean, I was in, at the post office a few hours ago and someone beside me was asking me about, well, what about this? And I said, I'm sorry. I can't do anything except tell you to, to do your best job. Right, you know? right. You know, it sounds like it's a frustrating role to play when you don't have the tools and you've got an environmental crisis on your hands. Well, isn't that interesting? Because I did this job three other terms. And Frank will remember, I did the job in the 80s and the 90s. And um, it was less frustrating then for two reasons. There were not the pressures to develop as there are now. There, our provincial budget was um, like almost 50% of our budget was provincially funded. So we felt like we could hire planners and do more planning, do more protection work. And I guess the other thing was... Uh, well, there wasn't the climate emergency in the 80s and the 90s. So what I see now as a trustee with lots of experience, and you know, I'm, I'm pretty broad-minded. Some, some of the most wonderful things on Gabriel will have happened because of people who have moved here in the last 10 years. But also some of the most terrible things have happened because of people who not just moved here, they've been here some time, but maybe they've just moved here, and they don't come to be in community, and they don't come to learn how to live here as a steward and as a good member of the community. They, they come to take. Mm. They come to extract and take. They don't come to be part of community and give. And that is so painful. And you don't feel like there's really anything that could be done to, you know, to, st to educate those people, inform those people, and then perhaps change their thinking? I, I never give up. I live with critical hope all the time. <laughs> you know, hope directed at getting stuff done, not just willy-nilly hope and hope that the, you know, climate will fix itself. I always live in hope that for example, I, I volunteer with the Nature Stewards with Gabriola Lands and Trails Trust, and what a great group they are. And every once in a while you visit a property with a new landowner, and this new landowner is like, oh, I didn't know that, oh, I can do that. It's like, oh, I love this, yes, you are such a wonderful person to have on this island that will help, you know, make this community stronger, maybe, maybe a little greener. Um, I never give up hope that people will be educated to, to just try harder. But, but I what, I, what I do sometimes despair at is at how little people of my generation and older, how little they will give up of their privileged lifestyle so that the next generation can just survive. I am shocked at how greedy and selfish people of my generation are. Of some, not, not all. I have lots of people working with me tirelessly on environmental issues, but that is what makes me feel despair, is you won't even give up that trip to Costco in your giant SUV to stock up on crap that comes over on freighters so that the next generation will have a place to live. That's what makes me angry and sad. And do you feel a little powerless at Yes, I at feel the powerless because... You can't change people's attitude by railing at them and being angry at them. Right, exactly. And so that actually leads me to my question about, I came over on the ferry. Yeah. I'm a newbie. Yeah. Now, I've been on the island, so I know about how you have to be conserving water and be careful with fire and all that. Mm -hmm. But lots of people who come over on that ferry are coming for a vacation. They're mm -hmm. from the city. They don't know anything about rural life. Mm -hmm. But I find people here on Gabriel, I expect anybody that comes here to know things. And I, mm -hmm. so I feel I, I am seeing this disconnect between the desire for everybody to be informed, mm -hmm. the need for people to be informed, but there's no informing going on. And that will only come from an authority like Islands Trust or RDN or the provincial government like with the provincial campaigns around earthquakes. That yes. raised everybody's awareness yes. around that. So I, I'm going to put that back to you mm -hmm. again. Why is Isla Trust not taking steps in that direction? On the ferry, for instance, mm -hmm. why isn't the BC ferry captain an authority yeah. 
talking to the passengers, locals and visitors, mm -hmm. saying, we're in an extreme fire risk right now, be mm -hmm. extra careful, you can't do this, or you know, whatever the message is. You know, is. they have done that before. Right, I've heard that. I've been on the ferry in past years where the captain has said something about the extreme fire risk right. and wildlife on the roads. So and, why isn't um, that happening right now? I mean, if, if it's such an extreme situation, yeah. where are the authorities hmm. in stepping up the campaign to actually inform residents about things? I mean, I don't think we can just sit back and expect everybody to watch the news. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are not watching news today, so how do we get right. to everybody, well, right? I know there's big signs on the Nanaimo side in, in the terminal waiting area about you know wildlife and fire risks, and, and I, I see those signs, but I'm kind of looking for them too. Um, but on this side, so when this you come side, off the ferry, off, there's nothing. Well, interestingly. Only a little sign by an arbutus tree. Yeah. Little tiny white sign, no fires. I know. Then you go up yeah. the road to the village, there's a big sign there, that's great. Stream. But yeah. why isn't there a ferry captain talking about it? Brochures oh, on the right. thing, big signs on the ferry. I don't well, know. Well, <laughs> you know, that's interesting. I am on the ferry advisory committee. Um, hey, there's a great idea that I can bring up. Because I think actually BC Ferries, is, is they have been very cooperative and very helpful in right. the past. Sometimes, you know, we're so frustrated with BC Ferries, but having seen the behind the scenes of how they operate, they have, they're overcoming some huge hurdles and they're actually doing a good job on many fronts. But that is something that we can bring up to the Ferry Advisory Committee and um, we get usually a pretty good response from them. Well, that would be awesome because I've yeah. heard so many people complaining. Right. And then also mm. the cigarette butts. Oh, well, I mean... Right? Yeah. So what's being done to target that particular group? For instance, but I was at the Gertie can bus you stop. Teach, can you teach anyone about cigarette butts? So, I mean, would anyone well, dropping a butt on the <laughs> dry ground actually listen to you? I bet you they would. I bet you if there was an ashtray there, they would put it in the ashtray. But at the Gertie bus stop, for instance, I was yeah. there yesterday. Yeah. Butts everywhere. And everybody's complaining. And I'm like, well, where's the ashtray? I mean, you know... Oh. Uh, there could be permanent ashtrays put there for smokers. And who so what are them? smokers supposed to do? I don't know. Yeah. The authorities have to figure these things out. I'm not okay. an authority. I'm asking okay. the questions. I'm writing that down too. I need All right. to borrow your pen. Okay, go uh, for because, it. Um, but it's just that... That's, what I, I mean, I'm on the Gertie... I mean, this is ridiculous. I'm also on the Gertie board. That's um, awesome. She's on everything. <laughs> but, but that would more likely be the responsibility of... someone maybe like Rick Mitchell who looks after the village right. property and he'd be quite sympathetic to that. So what I'm hearing and what you're saying is that the silos of government are still in place. So BC Ferries is over here, Islands Trust is here, RDN is here, the local people are here, and there's not a lot of communication about, you know, collaborating to make the message clear to all citizens, you know, that we have to be super, super careful right now. But I, I wouldn't have known that if people didn't tell me so I would really appreciate that. Like you said, there are local people who are really great. Right. But again, I don't think relying on individuals to take care of these matters is appropriate. I think it's a government responsibility. And so that's why I've asked you well, to ask these questions. I will. All right. And, I will, and if it's doable, it'll be done. Okay. Because that's how I operate. I like that. And um, we'll check back in with you later and see how things are going. That's right. But you know, the other thing is we have a visitor's information center. And I can say with quite delight that... Uh, the people working there, most of them are children that I've known since they were born on Gabriel, so they know the scoop. Yes. And I think people who check in there are given some pretty good directions and information about you know what to do on Gabriel, for sure, how to visit this place and not not endanger it. But not everybody goes to the tourist. Oh, I know. Stuff, right? yeah, just, a lot just of people come by their boats. Yeah. They come on yeah. the ferry, you know. So anyway, yeah. just raising that as a yeah. question because as a newcomer here, right. I've just been hearing and listening to, you know, the various concerns. Right. And uh, those two are big ones and, and I keep feeling like those are solvable in yeah. the sense of you know, it's all about communication in a disaster yeah. or in a crisis. Yeah. So where's the communication, I guess? And so yeah. I'll just leave that with mm -hmm. you. Do you have any final thoughts on, on you the know, climate what, emergency or just generally like about what you wanted to say to our audience mm -hmm. as a trustee from Islands Trust who is, you know, responsible for some of these things? Mm -hmm. It's a big responsibility. It's a yes. difficult time. I'll say one thing. I am so fortunate to have two to other local trustees who are on the local trust committee with me representing the Gabriela Trust area, 
Peter Luckham and Toby Elliott, who I think are just as uh, concerned and just as dedicated to doing a good job, as good a job as they can. And so working with them feels really good mm -hmm. because I could be working with other trustees who are not elected to support the trust, who are elected, in fact, to get rid of the trust, to represent private interests. This happens, as it happens anywhere in any government. You'll have counselors in a city who are there to help their friends develop inappropriately, right? I feel so lucky that my local trust committee is as, uh, as thoughtful as I am about where are we going? How can we get to a better place? How can we make, not make, how can we somehow get people to just do with less, just give up just a little bit so that there will be enough for the next generations, for the ecology of this place, for the foreshore, for the marine environment. Yeah, if I can, without lecturing, if I can just get that message out. Come to Gabriola, have a wonderful time, be part of this community. If you're just a visitor, um, please appreciate this, this beautiful natural environment and, and don't endanger it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. You're so welcome, Teresa. And um, you live here now, right? I do. I'm a resident. I am very happy to hear that. And <laughs> me uh, too. You've heard it from me. Be part of this community. I know you will because I remember hearing you on CBC Radio. I know you understand some the really important things that affect our environment. Well, thank you. It was yeah. really nice to meet you, and we'll have more conversations like this in the oh, future. Oh yes, we do. And any time you want to direct it at another specific issue, feel free. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. That was Susan Yates, a trustee with Islands Trust. She's one of three Island Trust trustees.